How would you like to reflect your plea? Your Honor, on behalf of Mrs. Daybell, she enters a not guilty plea to both charges and a request for a pretrial and a jury trial. Welcome to Long Crime Report, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We're going to start right with the woman that we've been following constantly on this program, Lori Vallow Daybell, the Idaho mother currently facing conspiracy charges for her alleged role in the discovery of her children's bodies found buried in her husband Chad's backyard. Now, her attorney, Mark Means, is now asking a judge to allow some new ways for him to be in contact with his client. One, he wants uh, Vallow to have, cell, to have a cell phone. Number two, he wants uninterrupted in-person meetings with his client. And number three, he wants the jail videos to be turned off when he meets with her. So is this all of a possibility? Well, let me bring in my guests right now. Joining me are trial attorney Nafis Syed and forensic investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan. I'm happy to have you both here. Nafis, I'll start with you. Some interesting requests. Uh, I'll give you the lineup of how you want to start. If you want to start with a cell phone, let's begin there. Do you think the court's going to allow Lori Vow to have a cell phone to communicate with her attorney? I think it's more, more probable that the court will grant her um, second request, which is to have face-to-face -face meetings with her attorney. Um, the defense is entitled to develop a legal case, um, and a legal case that isn't phone tapped um, by the prosecution, which uh, includes the, the police. Um, now, um, I don't think that the judge is going to grant all three of these requests because the Madison County Jail is really uh, trying to um, develop new procedures because of the unprecedented uh, COVID pandemic that we have, which forces them to restrict defendants' meetings with their attorneys. And I do think that um, after this ruling, however the judge rules, we're going to see a lot, many, many more requests like this from other defendants who are trying to build their legal strategy. Right, because otherwise she'd be treated as special, right, if he's in the sense that, and look, I know this is a really high profile case. There's a lot of attention to it, very important, serious accusations here. Mm -hmm. At the same point, if she's allowed uninterrupted access and for the jail videos to be turned out and for her to get a cell phone, that would, would that be fair? You know, on the other hand, her attorney had said, you know, from, I believe it was March when she was first incarcerated to uh, June, you know, he had trouble meeting with her. And then there were meetings that he had that were secretly, you know, telephone calls that were secretly recorded. At another point, she was in near distance to a deputy who could overhear everything. And it's hard to have that attorney-client privilege, that attorney-client communication, if you really don't have it in secret. And I understand there's a problem with COVID. But again, if you grant all these requests to her, what happens to everybody else? I completely agree. Um, and I think for that reason, the judge may ask uh, Madison County Jail um, about uh, what procedures they're developing for all defendants um, and um, how they're adapting to COVID and when they're going to implement this, because it's already been uh, several months. Um, and um, uh, I'm not sure exactly why um, the defense was not allowed to speak to um, Lori Daybell. Uh, during those three months, but if it was uh, due to COVID, they might be given a free pass. But they, I think they, the they were allowed to speak. It just wasn't allowed to have the in-person kind of meetings that you would have wanted, and and there were difficulties there. And I mean, I can understand. I mean, that was the height of when this was. She basically went mm -hmm. uh, to jail in March, and that's when the pandemic really, you know, fueled, fueled the fire. And so, Joseph, let me just turn to you while we have some time to talk about this, because you and I have been talking about this case a lot. And we learned some new things in the past month or so. We learned from when there was that whole hearing to determine if Rob Wood, the prosecutor, should be kicked off the case, which he ultimately wasn't. We heard in this secret recording between him and Lori Vallow's sister that, you know, the prosecution may intend to file these conspiracy to commit murder charges against Lori and Chad. We learned there's difficulty in understanding exactly what happened to Tylee, given the circumstances by which her body was decomposed. At this point, you imagine these conversations between Mark Means and Lori Vallow are reflecting that, right? I mean, what do you think we have learned? I mean, what have we learned? What new information have we learned about these kids' deaths and who caused these kids' deaths that maybe we didn't know before? What are, how are you viewing all this? Well, the biggest, the biggest piece of news in the last month is that comment that he made. 
that was recorded uh, where he stated uh, in the affirmative that there is potential for uh, these people to be charged. And, you know, that's what we've been waiting on all along, Jesse. Uh, you know, when, when are they going to pull the trigger on this thing and actually charge them with a homicide? We have these conspiracy charges and this sort of thing, and that's all fine and good. But, you know, they, they don't have a lot of weight when you start to talk about, uh, you know, the abuse of a corpse or what, however they're framing this legally. But, you know, what we're really waiting on is, you know, these charges relative, specifically relative to these deaths. And we found out that this is something that is on the horizon. It, it, it just has to be at this point, Jesse. And, and this is, I think this goes back to this idea of her meeting with her attorney, as, as you stated and our colleagues stated, uh, this is highly complex. And this requires, regardless of how you feel about Laurie Daybell, if you're planning a defense, this requires a very um, detailed, succinct uh, creation of a timeline, uh, just so that the, right. the defense has a way to understand this. So that's very important that they have the ability to meet. And there's constantly updates in this case that we're going to continue to follow, but we have a lot to talk about in the show, and I want to bring another update for a case that's been continuing on for quite some time. The alleged victims of disgraced former producer Harvey Weinstein, well, they can now expect to be paid. That's because a U.S. bankruptcy judge has officially approved a $35.2 million settlement plan for the liquidation of the Weinstein Company. And as part of this deal, over $17 million can be set aside to pay out and resolve claims of sexual misconduct. To give you a refresher, let's just go back to when there was a press conference held by the silence breakers following Harvey Weinstein's uh, guilty verdict here in New York. Take a look. Harvey, you messed with the wrong women. We will see you here in Los Angeles, where hopefully your conviction will leave you in jail for life. And to the rest of the 4% of the predators who create 91% of the problem, we are coming for you. As the lead plaintiff in the class action against Harvey Weinstein and as the chairwoman of his bankruptcy, I learned a lot about our judicial system. I learned how archaic our judicial system is in trying these cases. Only one to 3% of predators even get convicted. I learned that even with incredible amounts of evidence that judges will not even listen to it. I learned that women who are raped and sexually harassed and actually receive a settlement are then taxed because that harassment and rape is not seen as a personal injury. As a woman who is a survivor and good friends to many of these women who have been raped and harassed, I can tell you it is a personal injury for life. It is now time to create and change laws that rise up to our enlightened society that we seem to be becoming. If we are gonna ask women and men and transgender, if we're gonna ask everyone to stand up and rise up, then we need to ask our laws to rise up to support them. Again, it is documented that only one to 3% of these rape cases that they get convicted. So, Harvey, congratulations on being in the top percent once again, and we will get you in L.A. Thank you. Nafiz, let me start with this. Is this a good resolution in the end of the day? I know there was a ton of back and forth for quite some time on what a settlement would look like, when the, bank, the Weinstein Company would be liquidated, what would the victims get or the purported victims, how would this work, would any money go to Harvey Weinstein's legal defense fund, which it does not. None of the funds here are going to be allocated for him to pay his own legal bills. Is this the best resolution that everybody involved could have hoped for? I don't think so. And I have concerns with this settlement for two reasons. One is the actual amount, which is $17 million divided among 50 claimants. And the reason why the amount is so little is because this is an unusual case where we're looking at a bankruptcy court that first has to liquidate the assets of the Weinstein Company and then essentially distribute the leftover money to um, unsecured creditors and the victims. And that's why the amount is so little. And the second concern I have is the fine print. And a, a, 
a segment of the um, of the 50 victims have complained about this that um, this settlement forces them to release claims against Harvey Weinstein and um, those that they can allege uh, aided him in his sexual crimes. And they have a second option, which is that they can accept 25% of, um, of what they're given and in exchange still go after Harvey Weinstein, but not go after all of those other individuals that they say played a key role, including Harvey Weinstein's brother. So they could potentially recover a lot more money if they go these other routes. There are some women who have expressed their opposition to this plan, but then again, there's over 40 accusers who have signed off on this and have approved of it. Now, Joseph, I, I want to bring our attention to something Paul Zumbro, who is an attorney for the Weinstein Company estate, uh, said that he, you know, their team is pleased with the ruling, and there's now a mechanism that allows victims to receive compensation without having to endure the hardships and uncertainties of litigation. Well, if these claims, you know, if there are people who, if there are accusers who ultimately want to go to trial, that's their decision. But at the end of the day, these are tough, tough cases to prove, correct? Because the evidence is sometimes not always there in terms of uh, for physical, forensic evidence. A lot of it is based on witness testimony. We saw that happen to Harvey Weinstein when he was convicted here in New York and sentenced to 23 years. Your perspective. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the term rape has been used over and over again. And in forensics, in our parlance, you know, one of the things that we're looking for is uh, the, you know, assessment of the rape, you know, the physical assessment that occurs following a violent sexual attack and also the rape kits that have been in the press for years and years about being processed. Here, that's non-existent. So, yeah, there's not a lot from an evidentiary standpoint. I'm talking about from a physical standpoint, not testimonial or anything like this, interviews. I'm talking about just merely physical evidence that we can hang our hat on. Um, even access to, say, for instance, daily logs of who came in, who came out, maybe CCTV footage. I don't know if any of that stuff exists. I got to tell you, you know, you were talking about the $17 million that has been set aside for them, this pot, you know, that they're going to draw from. I don't know about you, Jesse. I've watched a lot of uh, Tarantino's movies, and he was, you know, he made a lot of money. Thirty-two million dollars seems a little bit light, you know, when we're talking about liquidation of the Weinstein Company. This is a massive, massive company, and uh, that that value seems greatly undervalued. I know that they have debts to pay and whatnot, but it seems it just seems light financially uh, moving forward. So, you know, just as a moviegoer. And, uh, you know, a, a film a, a film lover, it, it's just one of these things you hear about all these gigantic numbers that are thrown around. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, thirty two million dollars worth of value. That's kind of a head scratcher. Well, look, it, it's a difficult negotiation and it might be the conclusion to the stories and the claims of some of these women, but maybe not all. And maybe they will choose to not opt in and and decide to take their cases to court. That's their decision. And it'll be interesting to see who chooses what they'll, what they'll ultimately do based on this plan. But we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we want to switch gears and focus on something else, a big development in the case of Robert Kraft. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. Another big win for Patriots owner Robert Kraft, because a judge has ordered those videos of Kraft allegedly receiving sexual services at a Florida massage parlor to be destroyed. That's right. This comes after the solicitation charges against Kraft were dropped when it was ruled that the videos were illegally obtained by law enforcement. And just to give you a refresher, this is actually Dave Arenberg, the state attorney from Palm Beach County, Florida, speaking about when the charges were thrown out. The Florida Attorney General recently announced that the state is not appealing the adverse ruling by the Fourth District Court of Appeal that suppressed the video recordings in the Orchids of Asia prostitution case. Without these videos, we cannot move forward with our prosecutions. And thus, we are ethically compelled to drop the cases against all the defendants. The appellate court decision was disappointing. And I disagree with the result that threw out the videos for all 25 of our defendants, because four other individuals also were recorded, although not continuously observed. 
they were receiving legitimate non-sexual massages. Two of those individuals out of the four were women. And the court said that the police should never have recorded the two women and thus every video must be discarded. Although I disagree with the court's ruling, I respect it. I also understand the decision of the Florida Attorney General and Solicitor General not to appeal these misdemeanor cases to the Florida Supreme Court. The risk of appealing the Fourth District Court of Appeals three to zero ruling outweighs any benefit. The Attorney General was concerned and we agreed that the Supreme Court could expand the appellate court's ruling to ban hidden cameras uh, entirely in cases of prostitution and beyond, possibly impeding law enforcement from secretly recording human trafficking, drug trafficking, theft rings, chop shops, and other criminal enterprises. Although I'm disappointed in the result of these cases, which arose from criminal investigations in Martin County, the Jupiter Police Department did the right thing in pursuing the investigation. And I stand behind the decision to file the cases. Okay, a, a lot to talk about here. Uh, Nafiz, let me start with you. What was the rationale for the judge here to have these tapes destroyed? Because there are many times we see cases where there's an acquittal, the charges are dismissed, but whatever that evidence is, was still released to the public and everybody for their own choice decides what they feel about that person. This is a different case. There's a chance we may never see anything on those tapes, and I'll get into that in a second with Joseph, but what's the legal rationale for having these tapes destroyed? Well, the judge's legal rationale is um, one, as the, the state attorney mentioned, there was a privacy concern because um, a few of the individuals who were taped were there, um, a, a couple of them um, were women, were there for legitimate reasons. Um, Kraft, on the other hand, uh, the police have a video of him allegedly paying a massage parlor for sex. So I'm not entirely sure why the judge used the, the um, instances of people legitimately having massages to discard all of the evidence. And that's what the state attorney was alluding to. And um, I think that this raises larger questions that um, a lot of people have had after his charges were dropped, which is, do we have one law for billionaires and another law for the rest of us? I can't imagine um, other uh, sex offender defendants, Harvey Weinstein included, asking the court to permanently destroy the evidence. And this case reminds me a lot of the Jeffrey Epstein case, which also occurred in this jurisdiction um, a decade ago, where police did an excellent job of gathering data. And when justice wasn't served back then, prosecutors now and uh, attorneys for the victims now are relying on that incredible evidence from years ago. And now, uh, if, this, if this video is destroyed, we're not going to have the evidence to prosecute him in the future. Joseph, let's get into that. How on earth can you just delete something from the face of the earth? Because it's my understanding they're going to have a neutral third party assigned to destroy the videos. But again, what prevents somebody between now and then just take going on their cell phone and taking a video of this video and it's somehow circulating? I mean, there are leaks about all different kinds of things on the internet, internet all the time. How is it possible there won't be a leak of this somewhere? So how are they going to plan to destroy that? And then how are they going to plan to monitor any leaks of this video? Just okay. put it, put it in this context, Jesse. Think about how porous even our intelligence services are. And, you know, they're known for secrecy. We're, we're talking about a local uh, police department, essentially, uh, that is being, you know, uh, tasked with this idea of protecting uh, protecting uh, the uh, and actually destroyed. Uh, do you have a, a, a mediator that comes in, almost a, a person that's going to watch care? And even then, how do you go back retrospectively and assure that no other copies have been made of these tapes? This is digital gold, uh, Jesse. Uh, can you imagine 
if someone had it in their possession of Robert Kraft, uh, uh, Tom Brady's former boss, actually uh, engaging in nefarious activity, how much that would be worth worldwide on the internet. There's no telling who would uh, who would pay for this and how much they would pay for it. Uh, so it, it's one of these things that I don't know how you would go about ensuring that this thing is destroyed. This is not like the days of analog video, which they made copies back then. Mm-hmm. This is a digital format. So that's, I don't know, your, your, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine at this point. I don't know how, they, how they're going to uh, certify this, how they're going to reassure people that this is gone forever and ever. I'm in. I think it's a separate question on you know who would actually want to watch it if it actually came out. That's a personal judgment for a lot of people. And, and a question for an entirely different show. But let's keep going because we heard about these arguments against these videotapes when uh, Derek Shaper, uh, the attorney for Robert Kraft, made these arguments uh, back in June, June of 2020. Uh, basically, this is prior to the charges being dismissed saying why this videotape was illegal. Where Officer Sharp testifies that contrary to what he submitted in the warrant application, right after he got authorization from the issuing judge, they put in a co- they they put in an undercover officer into this spot. I didn't mean to interrupt, Your Honor, but I think it's no, no, it, it's important you. to no, underline I, that I mean, point. There's several cases here, so getting all the facts right in each one is a little uh, challenging. And and Judge Sicklin, we stand by our submission that it was wholly gratuitous to resort to this very dangerous, problematic, invasive form of surveillance here. And there's no question of standing. It's, it's a gating issue. I think it is absolutely clear under all the cases that have decided this question that the Fourth Amendment requires a showing of necessity before the state can put uh, covert video surveillance into private settings. And that necessity showing is heightened. The demands are heightened the more private and sensitive the setting. And here we're talking about private massage rooms where patrons would be undressing as a matter of course. So the state has an especially high bar it needs to clear in order to establish necessity. And my best authority for the proposition that they didn't come close to clearing it, Judge Sicklin, is Mr. D'Souza. Because Mr. D'Souza tells you what is clear from the warrant application, that the state had been successful in stopping male patrons coming out of the spot, went four for four in obtaining their confessions, that they had uh, paid for sex acts while they were at the spot. That's in the warrant application. The state had also been successful in recovering physical evidence via trash pulls. That's in the warrant application. And this, it's also in the warrant application that they got credit card receipts and a spreadsheet as to the financial aspects of these transactions. So it's not just that traditional investigative techniques could work in this case, just as they've worked in prostitution cases since time immemorial. It was working. By all indication, traditional investigative techniques, techniques were perfectly fit for purpose. And that's why Mr. D'Souza can say, look, it was no surprise what was uncovered, according to law enforcement, when they started spying on the spa, because they knew what they were going to invite, and indeed, they already had abundant evidence of it. So there's really no coherent necessity justification that can be found from the state. That's my respectful submission, Your Honors. And if I give the state every benefit of the doubt, what they were still looking to prove is not that there were sex acts that were being performed and being paid for inside the spa, it's that proceeds were being derived and that those proceeds were going to the register. We'll look what the warrant application and what the warrant tell you about where evidence of that would be found. It's at the front lobby of the business is where the exchange of money is believed to be occurring. You can find that in the record 3260, that's the warrant application and 3264, that's the warrant itself. Nafiz, you're hearing these arguments that the court ultimately sided with, and it makes sense that the prosecution dropped these charges because without these video, really, what do you have? And you heard something from Dave Arenberg before where he he basically said, look, we could have appealed this. We could have gone even further and tried to fight this, but we were worried that, you know, an even higher court, the Supreme Court would have said, you know, we'll, we'll do an overarching decision that might really impede law enforcement's ability to gather these kind of materials, to gather these kinds of videos in the future. Um, do you think that was the right decision? Because I know that they really were going strong against Robert Kraft. They wanted to secure a conviction. They wanted this case to go forward, and their case fell apart. So they could have appealed. They chose not to. Was that the right decision? I mean, that's definitely the right question for this um, situation, because it seems like what the judge did here is looped um, all of these privacy concerns together as if they were equivalent. 
so what Schaefer was alluding to was um, the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, where um, if the police didn't have um, adequate need um, to um, invade these individuals' privacies, then um, the evidence should be thrown out. But the right of privacy for those individuals who were receiving legitimate uh, massages and those women is very different from the case of Robert Kraft, where the prosecution had a very different set of evidence. And, you know, they were also looking at financial records. And this video is really uh, key for that because it um, allegedly shows him um, paying um, uh, for sex at the at the massage parlor. parlor. So I do think, um, to your question, the state attorney should have um, appealed to the Supreme Court and said, hey, uh, the case of Robert Kraft is very different from the case of, of these other individuals. And his expectation of privacy based on our evidence and based on our warrant is very different from that of, of the other individuals. And the judge below incorrectly didn't separate these cases, loop them all together. And because of that, we're left without a case that our police and um, investigators have been working on for such a long time. And Joseph, people might look at this and said, how, how is it possible they made this mistake? You're somebody who's, who's worked in the law enforcement capacity for quite some time. You've been a part of this. How is it possible that they let this mistake happen? Or does it happen more times than we realize? And it just matters whether or not a defense attorney catches it. I think that there's a thread that runs through these types of uh, prostitution investigations relative to, you know, for a long time, the, the idea was entrapment, that you're going to entrap the individual. How far is a police officer allowed to go in, uh, for instance, not revealing their police officer? And even in the midst of an act, a sexual act that's being performed on them in the course of an investigation. So this is a very kind of fine line that the police walk anyway. And then you kind of throw into the mix uh, the celebrity of, of uh, Robert Kraft uh, in this, and it, it makes for an interesting, um, an interesting narrative moving forward. But Jesse, I don't know if you recall this, when you and I first started talking about this case, a good while ago, one of the themes that was coming up in here uh, was this tie back to uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, because a lot of the women that are involved in these uh, businesses and whatnot, they're there against their will. They're being compelled to mm -hmm. do this against their will. And I think that maybe uh, the political types in, in uh, Florida wanted to use this demonstration of craft uh, to demonstrate that this is how far this reaches. You know, a man that can have anything in the world, and he he's at one mm -hmm. of these spas with women who are potentially trafficked mm -hmm. in here. And I think that's a bigger story. And, and look, it should be noted, he was never charged with any human tra sex trafficking charges. He was just facing these misdemeanor solicitation right. prostitution charges, serious counts. But it's still, it, it's interesting because he was somehow allegedly tied to that. And we will... By all accounts, never see those videos. All right, when we come back, there's a lot of fallout from the Capitol riots that we still have to sort through. So we'll be right back right after this. The men and women of the FBI will leave no stone unturned in this investigation. Since these events, the FBI has worked hand in hand with the United States Attorney's Office and our law enforcement partners here in D.C. and across the country to arrest and charge multiple individuals who took part in the destruction. In six days, we have opened over 160 case files, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. The significance of this investigation is not lost on us. This is a 24-7, full-bore, extensive operation into what happened that day. We cannot do our job without the help of the American people. Since our call for tips, videos, and pictures, we have received more than 100,000 pieces of digital media, which is absolutely fantastic. And we are scouring every one for investigative and intelligence leads. All right, lots to talk about with the January 6th Capitol riots, and we're gonna start with a federal judge halting the release of Eric Marshall. This is the man who's accused of bringing zip ties to the insurrection. 
Uh, you might have seen a picture of him before or pictures of him. And this actually blocks a previous order from another judge that would have set Munchell free. Uh, although currently he faces a host of charges, including conspiracy and disorderly conduct, he could now be charged with sedition. Joseph, I want to start with you on this. You look at this guy and you see in the zip ties, I know they did a search of his home. They found uh, weapons, ammunition, handcuffs. Based on this, what do you think he had planned that day, dressed in tactical gear? I know his mother has been charged. He traveled to Washington, D.C. What, what do you think he had planned? I don't know. That's that's the rub, isn't it? Uh, you, it's, it's, uh, it's discovering what his intent was at that particular time. Um, you know, you can go down to Home Depot or any other, you know, home supply store and you can buy zip ties. So I, I would... I would hope that they have more than merely evidence of zip ties on his person. And I think I'd be interested to know if there was any kind of literature uh, that he was uh, uh, ascribing to uh, that would give an indication as to an organization he might be a member of. And, and I, think, I think one of the troubling things about this for me is, given uh, the FBI's past about infiltrating organizations and this sort of thing, and really having the radar up um, as to potential uh, risk in our history, you know, throughout law enforcement history. Um, I'd, I'd like to know what the FBI knew beforehand, before these riots took place. Did they have uh, assets in place that were giving them information relative to this? Because at this point in time, it kind of seems like it's a surprise to them uh, because they're relying on tips and this sort of thing. Um, you know, based upon, a, you know, a, a rally that was well known in advance that was going to occur where you had a lot of people there. Uh, did they have any further information uh, that uh, maybe we're not aware of at this point? Bob? Now, Nafiz, I turn it to you because you have this judge saying that this guy should not be released yet. They're going to look for more information. So I'm going to ask you a two parter here. I mean, what are they looking for at this point? And number two, the sedition charge. What does that mean? What is that penalty for that? And number three, what do they have to do to prove that? Because this is now a waiting game. You have this, you see a guy with zip ties, you see him planning for something. What do they have to prove to, to ultimately show sedition? What is that? Well, to your first question, I think that the judge absolutely made the right decision here. Um, even under President uh, Trump, uh, uh, former President Trump, his FBI chief said that the number one terror threat to the United States is white supremacists. And we, um, the FBI alleges that this man um, not only participated um, in the insurrection, and remember, insurrection is the highest crime against the U.S. government, um, but that um, uh, his appearance and his um, tactical gear and his zip ties um, strongly um, uh, informs uh, law enforcement of an intent to kidnap members of Congress. And we know there were armed insurrectionists who were going into these congressional offices hunting for members of Congress. And uh, this man was just seconds away um, from uh, uh, an empty Senate chamber um, just minutes before um, Vice President Pence, who uh, some insurrectionists wanted to lynch. Um, and uh, other members of the Senate and members of the House were, um, were in this um, chamber. And um, to your uh, second question about sedition and how we can prove that. Um, so sedition is um, the attempt to overthrow, put down, or destroy a government by force. And he's looking at um, around 20 years here. And I think that he'll get much more than that. And I think in the coming weeks, we'll see many more char uh, charges coming because right now there's um, a changing of the guard. We have a new president and right. um, Biden um, has called all of these individuals domestic terrorists, um, as have um, the leaders of um, the House and the Senate. And as um, uh, uh, the new attorney general is sworn in and as new U.S. attorneys are appointed across the United States, I think we're going to see right. more charges of not just sedition, but domestic terrorism, well, treason. There's, and and there just, to, just, to re charges. just to jump on yeah. this real quick, staying with it, sedition does 
but technically carry the death penalty, but you don't think that's something that the federal government would ultimately seek here, right? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, under the Biden administration, um, it's possible that they might um, seek a, right. a, a death penalty, but um, right now the situation is just so political that I'm I'm really not sure yeah. how far and it's go early. In the it's early. Yeah. I mean, it's early to even say that they're still gathering information about him. And I'm sorry yeah, to cut exactly. you off these, but there's so much to talk about more with these riots. I mean, I could get into the fact that mm -hmm. 38 Capitol police officers have now tested positive for COVID, possibly as a result of everything that happened. But I do want to still focus on something that we've talked about a lot in this program. And that's an update in the case of Riley June Williams because she's the woman who's accused of stealing the, a laptop from Nancy Pelosi's office during these riots and in an effort to sell it to a Russian contact. Uh, that plan ultimately fell through. But she, now she is alleged to have destroyed evidence and encouraged others to do as well. So prosecutors say that Williams, after she was released to home confinement, she deleted her social media accounts and she told others to delete messages that she sent them. So the state now wants her monitored and for her internet access to be cut off as she remains in home confinement. Joseph, I'll start with you. We're talking about possible destruction of evidence. What are your thoughts here? Uh, well, obviously, uh, she was motivated to, to do this because she feels as though that she's left a trail uh, behind and wants to uh, delete that, get rid of it, because for her, at least, in her way of thinking, uh, that it has some kind of evidentiary value that could potentially point back to her and maybe some troubling involvement that she had. So um, it's going to be curious. I'll be curious to see how the court deals with this relative to uh, her First Amendment rights, uh, her uh, their ability to kind of lock her down, uh, keep her off of the web. I don't know how you would necessarily go about uh, facilitating that um, and so that means that she's probably not going to have access to a phone, for instance. And, uh, you know, how is she going to, unless it's a hardline phone that runs into her home, and is she going to be confined mm -hmm. to that space? Uh, is she, is she well, going well, to have... Let's, let's get into that a little bit, right? Because, Nafiz, if we get into what could the court do, I mean, this is a person who's accused of theft, trespassing, obstruction, violent entry, and disorderly conduct. What could the court legally do here? And number two, the judge himself who was overseeing this said he was surprised the prosecution didn't ask for her to be detained. They're still saying it's okay for her to be in home confinement. What is going on here and, and what could ultimately happen to her? Yeah, that quote by the, um, the question by the magistrate judge um, also struck me, Jesse, because I was thinking the same thing. This woman should be behind bars and it, it's, really baffling why um, the government isn't requesting that again. As I mentioned um, earlier, the FBI chief under former President Trump himself said the, the greatest terror threat to our nation is white supremacists. And we know um, that the FBI alleges that they have video footage of her um, in the insurrection. She posted social media videos um, of her um, allegedly stealing the um, the laptop. I, they were all over YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. um, it's really questionable why we're talking about whether she can have internet access when the FBI yeah. um, alleges that she tried to sell this information to Russia. Um, it's just really baffling, and, and she should be behind bars. This is very, very dangerous um, to have her um, a, out in society. Um, even if she is under house arrest. Well, under well, 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 I'll tell you this. I don't think a, a lack of internet access is going to be the, the worst of her concerns. She has a lot on her plate yeah. right here. And as you said, it could ultimately get worse. We'll take a break because our final story is a really interesting one. Some potential violence occurred at the uh, AFC championship game, including a prominent R&B singer. We'll be right back right after this. And welcome back, everybody. R&B superstar Trey Songs was arrested for allegedly getting into a scuffle with a police officer at the, Bill and Chief, the Bills and Chiefs AFC Championship game. Now, this occurred after the singer, whose real name is Tremaine Neverson, reportedly was creating a scene by 
breaking COVID safety rules, that he was drunk, he was using profane language. This is what the accusations are. Uh, there's a video that's circulating on the web. It was published by TMZ. And, and though he's released from jail, we're all asking what could happen next. So, Joseph, I want to start with you. You know, the video, when you look at it, from your perspective, a video is always the key piece of evidence. Now, it starts at a particular time. We don't see particularly what happened before, uh, but it seems that the allegations were um, that Mr., uh, Mr. Neverson was almost getting heckled by the crowd or they were really, you know, agitating him some kind because of the, what he was doing. And this is what everything happened. Now, I'm curious, as you look at the video, what is your take? Oh, well, you know, I, I can tell you just speaking, <laughs> speaking uh, relative to the nature of police officers, if you put your hands on a police officer, you're going to jail. And one of the things that's been alleged about this is that not only did he strike a police officer, but he allegedly put a police officer in a headlock. They were trying to defuse the situation, allegedly, by bringing in stadium security. And you can clearly see on the video that uh, that not only do you have local Kansas City PD, you've got the sheriff uh, that's there. You've got a, a multitude of these officers that are around him. And then, yeah, I'm sure that the crowd was egging him on. Uh, listen, I'm an old guy with gray hair. I'm not familiar with his music, but I'm sure a lot of the people in the crowd uh, were fully aware of who he was. He's got great seats. They're down, looks like, on the 50-yard line, lower level. Right. He can afford seats for this game. So, yeah, they were probably egging and, him and on. And you have a lot of witnesses were... now. The, yeah, there's probably did. a lot of witnesses really. are being interviewed about, about what's happening. Yeah. And the fees, the qu yeah. ex exactly. And, and the fees, the question is now, could he argue self-defense in this situation? It's possible because right now we don't have the whole picture. Um, and right now it's just a he said, he said type of thing. Um, but there are so many witnesses, and I'm sure many of the witnesses were also taking uh, videos. So as this is pieced together um, by investigators, I'm sure they'll be able to get the entire picture, um, because right now we don't have a clear understanding of who started it, but it doesn't look very good for him because, um, I mean, he is trying to, um, it looks like he's trying to put the police officer in a headlock and um, isn't mm -hmm. you know, behaving well, and the um, reinforcements appear well, to be necessary based on his behavior. Well, let, let me ask you this. What charges could he face? Because it's not entirely clear what he was arrested on. Uh, so what charges could he face? And number two, and this is the thing that if I was his lawyer, I'd be really concerned about, is that a few years ago, back in 2017, he was charged with felony assault and assaulting a police officer. He pled guilty mm -hmm. uh, and was ultimately sentenced to 18 months of probation. So now he's in a very similar position. How could this affect him? I think his past behavior um, is not going to help him. And I think using that, um, law enforcement can say, hey, um, he has a history of being aggressive with law enforcement, and they'll try to charge him with assaulting a, a assault and battery on a police officer, which um, has greater consequences in sentencing than it does for um, a regular individual. And on top of the fact that if he has these pro this prior history, if there is, it goes to a jury and ultimately a mm -hmm. guilty verdict, or if he takes a deal, you would imagine a harsher sentence based on this past, a very similar conduct. So uh, I'm curious to see. Nafiz, we have about uh, 20 seconds. Am I on the right track there? I think so. Um, and I think that um, the um, prosecution is going to try to get that prior um, uh, a prior conviction, uh, those prior charges in somehow during an actual trial. Right. Um, and then again, right. as you pointed out, during sentencing um, it, to get him a harsher yeah. sentence. Well, I think we'll all see where this goes. Joseph's going to listen to his musics, and we'll all recap maybe on the next Long Crime Report. I appreciate you all coming on. Uh, thank you so much, everyone out there. Thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Report. We're back every day at 12 p.m. We'll see you tomorrow.